Hello everybody, so in case you still don't know, I am working on a series of videos dealing with broadly the topic of are gender critical individuals right wing or indeed are gender critical ideas themselves right wing. I'm not going to give the whole kind of recap of what I've done already, um, but I will say that this video was one which um, I was released after I already started working on this series. So it was an addition, which means the whole series overall is going to get longer, but that's fine. Uh, and I don't know how long it's going to take to respond to this, but it is a video by the uh, familiar channel favorite, Jesse Gender. I responded to one of Jesse Gender's videos before on basically explaining gender critical ideas and how gender critical ideas are supposedly harmful. And I didn't really uh, agree with that video. I thought there were some issues with it. And it took me, I think, five parts to respond to. I'm hoping this won't take quite as long to respond to. Um, but yeah, basically, it's a recent video. So um, I think, you know, it's, you know, clearly it was just destiny. And I tell you what, it's been cropping up in my mentions a lot. Uh, and obviously, it's been recommended to me. So I'm looking forward to just jumping in, responding, getting it done. So so here we go. Transphobia, more importantly, is being weaponized to help embolden and prop up larger, darker movements like white supremacy and fascist ideology. And I know. For okay, there we go. I just want to say that is, you know, I'll pause here. Just say that is the goal. So to show how, um, basically, transphobia, which I mean, obviously. I assume it's going to be specifically related to being gender critical um, because obviously, you know, I don't really think being transphobic is a thing, but I know that a lot of people who do will think that women having uh, strong opinions about how the word women should be defined would fall under the category of uh, transphobia. So apparently it's going to explain how that can lead to the spreading of uh, white supremacy and uh, fascist ideas. There we go. That's that's the mission statement. I hope that I've proven through some of my other work that I try to be as level headed and rational and calm as I possibly can about these things. And so, you know, you know, I, I will say that I think uh, Jesse Gender is calm. Uh, you know, I, I don't think Jesse Gender's like uh, has a bad attitude in the videos. I just think Jesse Gender has some bad ideas um, that so I'm going to, you know, I'll try to be charitable. She did a famous speech. She said, ain't I a woman? Ain't I a woman? And I found his citing of Sojourner Truth in the context of a conversation about LGBTQ and trans rights and the intersectionality of racism and LGBTQ, trans, women's issues, all this stuff, to be particularly insightful to me, even if I don't think he took it far enough within the special, I think the reference is actually really interesting. Okay, so I can kind of already predict where this is going to go. Uh, I'm not sure if I should respond to what I feel I can predict, but it seems like there's actually going to be quite a while talking about this. So, uh, yeah, I guess I'll actually let what I think is going to be said be said and respond to it as it comes. There are more educated women than all the illiterate voters, white and black, native and foreign, combined. As you probably know, of all the women in the South who can read and write, 10 out of every 11 are white. Okay, I just need to stop here because basically... Um, it feels weird. I'm trying to actually not just respond to every single little thing um, because I kind of want to get through this video kind of quickly. But I do feel kind of just lazy being sat here watching this, not responding. So I just want to say that the main point being got at here is that there were women in the late 19th and early 20th century who were involved in the suffrage movement who were also racist. It's not really anything to refute here, but it's just that if the next thing I end up responding to is like 10 minutes into the video, you may wonder what kind of stuff was being said early on. And the answer is this kind of history, which is pretty obvious, pretty uncontroversial. And so far, no actual substantive argument has been made, you know, premised upon or based upon this history. But these images were used to frame black women as less than and their womanhood as not as real as white women's. As a result, black... Okay, like, I mean, how long am I going to wait until I just point out, like, it's so kind of predictable where this is going. So I'm just going to say it now. Uh, I think basically, spoiler alert, you know, I said earlier that I knew where this was going. Yeah, I mean, basically, I could literally have refuted it preemptively. And I think I'm kind of going to do this now. Uh, basically, you know where this is going. It's so obvious. It's like black women's womanhood was uh, delegitimized. Therefore, that's equivalent to biological males' womanhood being delegitimized. Um, and obviously, if you are a black woman, this should offend you a lot to hear. When you ultimately strip everything away here, you're basically saying that a black woman's claim to being a woman is no more legitimate than a biological male's claim to being a woman. And therefore, if we are to accept that black women are women and acknowledge that the uh, attempts to kind of undermine their womanhood was wrong, then we should also accept the same thing 
of biological males. There is also, of course, another thing here, which is I don't really think these two things are equivalent. When you talk about um, biological males having their womanhood denied, it's based on material reality. It's, it's literally just based on cold, hard material reality. There's no hatred to it. There's not even really any judgment to it. I mean, when I just say, oh, that biological male is a man, not a woman, that's not a judgment. It's not, it's not really even a criticism at all. It's really, if it's a criticism, then it's a criticism of the people who would imply the opposite. However, by contrast, when you talk about black women having their femininity denied, well, that's kind of the key thing. It's femininity. This is actually the um, undermining of black women's womanhood is entirely based in stereotypes. It's based in this kind of mythical idea of being a true woman and stuff like that. Uh, obviously, it's not based in cold, hard material reality. Uh, nobody's looking at cold, hard material reality and coming away with the conclusion that black adult human females aren't women. The reason why black women have had their kind of womanhood denied is because of the exact kind of nonsense stereotypes and idea of like there being some kind of essence of being a true woman, uh, which is exactly the kind of ideology that you, Jesse Gender, uphold. And that's of course the other thing, which is that really, and this is something which Simone de Beauvoir talks about, there's like a kind of idea of like woman kind of means two different things, where it's like woman in the cold hard objective sense, and then there's woman in like the essential woo-woo sense. Um, and it's why Simone de Beauvoir talks about this idea of like people saying that women aren't women. And like that's kind of a thing which Simone de Beauvoir talks about in like um, the opening to the second sex. Like this idea that people acknowledge women, but then they say they're not women because they don't conform. So it's almost like they have an idea that like woman is like a just objective thing that exists in reality. But then they also have this idea of like a true woman so that they can say women aren't women. Uh, anymore. And the reality is, if you're a gender critical feminist or gender critical individual in general who only cares about the cold, hard material reality and you reject the woo woo nonsense, then, uh, basically you, you could never even say the logic of, you know, black women aren't real women. That would be completely incoherent to say. And by the way, you can't say trans women aren't real women either. That trans women aren't women full stop. Now, by contrast, if you're somebody who denies the cold hard objective reality, instead talk about living like a woman, feeling like a woman, uh, being a woman deep down inside, and you start acting as if material reality can be altered to reflect the, the reality of your true womanhood, you're, you're much more uh, in, into this thing, this thing, which is the thing that was appealed to in order to deny the reality, the, car, the hard, cold, biological, material reality of black women's womanhood. Like, it's absolutely absurd to say of the people who are concerned about biological material reality, by which black women are undeniably female, to say that those people are the ones who are trying to, or akin to, denying black women's womanhood. It's like, oh, you only care about biological material reality? You must not think that black females are women. <laughs> it's absurd. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure this point is going to be made more substantially, uh, but I just figured I would jump in and already, because we know it's coming. And so I tell you this brief overview of Sojourner Truth's life because I just want you to be thinking about it as we get into the next part of this video, and we will be returning to it towards the end of this video. Okay, so that was what we got so far on Sojourner Truth. Apparently, we're going to be returning to it towards the end of the video. Again, I feel like we're going to get to a point where some very obvious and predictable analogies are cleverly made, and it's kind of like they're very predictable, but we have to wait apparently until the end of the video to actually uh, see them be uh, fully realized. The term TERF has been somewhat diluted in mainstream discourse to become to mean any women or feminist that espouses any type of transphobia or anything that is deemed to be transphobia. Now, that's a whole other discussion that we can talk about, but for- You know, you know what I mean? Respect for acknowledging that the term TERF has become very broad and, you know, maybe less meaningful, uh, you know, I mean, I think that's a, a good thing to be pointing out, so well done. And if you want to know more about what I'm talking about specifically with that ideology in a general sense before getting into some of the specifics that I'm going to be talking about in this video, I did a whole video that I'll link up here that talk- Okay, that's the video I already responded to. So, um, you know, I don't think it's- I don't think it's that good, um, but you know, whatever. Okay, that was- <laughs> That we're really just uh, smashing through these parts. Honestly, I feel like if I had been very strict with my kind of not responding to something until there's something to respond to, I wouldn't have said anything yet. 
Really? Because I, I stopped for like the history of uh, racist uh, white women in the suffragette movement, which I didn't really think there was anything to respond to there. I just wanted to point out it was happening. Then there was the other thing where I was just anticipating that was when the argu- where the argument was going to go. That um, it was going to go along the lines of, uh, well, uh, just like black women's womanhood is being denied, so are trans women's womanhood. Um, so, yeah, I, I predicted that. But again, that argument hadn't actually been made yet. So I was just anticipating that. And then obviously I gave the credit for recognizing that um, turf is quite a broad term. But to be honest, like the point I'm getting at is that I didn't need to respond to any of those things. And if I had, like I say, been super strict... I still wouldn't have responded to anything, and we're already on part three. The LGB Alliance is a gender critical. Oh, the LGB Alliance. And first off, LGB Alliance worked to oppose and even vilified the charity Stonewall. One of the. Okay, sorry, I just need to stop here. I think so. This is going to be a big thing about like um, LGB Alliance actually doing things in opposition to. Um, the uh trans identify people now i think this was it, depending on whether or not something happens with my upload schedule because i'm recording in advance more often nowadays so it's possible my upload schedule might change but it should be that this is literally the last video i did something on um and in that video it was getting a bit long so i actually ended up cutting this out there was a little bit about how um i think the lgb alliance i, I kind of included part of this but i went on a longer rant about it uh, the lgb alliance i don't think they should even like try to frame themselves as not anti-trans it might be i was thinking after the fact when i was editing it that maybe the reason why they do that is because it relates in some way to their charity status which to be honest i think is nonsense i think a charity should be able to frame itself in opposition to certain things and it should be able to frame itself in opposition to um trans identities uh but whatever anyway i just think like ultimately it makes it easy for people to kind of suggest they're dishonest because it's kind of like i wouldn't say that I am, you know, like, ultimately, I think, as I've said before, I don't really think being trans is an actual thing. But recognizing that people do think being trans is an actual thing, I would accept the label anti-trans. Like, if somebody wanted to say, I am anti-trans, I would say, you know what, based on what I think you're probably trying to get at there, which is my rejection of the entire notion that transgender identities are valid, yeah, sure, I will accept that label. So I wouldn't really have any interest personally in trying to argue that I am not anti-trans. I think it's a pointless argument to get into. And because I think it's a pointless argument to get into, I hate to do this, but um, for the rest of this video, the, or for the rest of this section trying to argue that, in fact, the LGB alliance is anti-trans, uh, I'm not going to touch on that because it's not something which I think matters. I actually think they should be anti-trans if anti-trans means rejecting the uh, idea that transgender identities are valid. Uh, I think that would be a good thing for LGB alliance to be, so... If you're going to make that case, as far as I'm concerned, you're just giving them kudos. So the removal of Stonewall's diversity program from these groups not only hurt trans people, but LGBTQ people in general. And the Okay, so very quick, if you oppose an organization because you think that in some ways they are bad for the people you're advocating for, even though in some ways they're good for the people you're advocating for, it's completely legitimate to oppose the movement on the whole uh, based on the idea that you can oppose the bad things they're doing and the good things they're doing. You can either, when possible, maintain the good things they're doing, but more likely you could just try to achieve the good things they're doing through other means. So I just wanted to clarify that's not a legitimate reason to think that uh, LGB Alliance are trying to hurt uh, same-sex attracted individuals, which wasn't necessarily stated, but I just thought it was worth stressing. It would just be kind of silly to say, well, this terrible organization has some good policies, so therefore if you oppose the terrible organization on the whole, it must mean that you, uh, you know, oppose the few good policies they have. That would obviously be kind of silly. Stonewall likened gender-critical feminists, sometimes called TERFs as I said, to anti-Semitism and racism. And so the BBC left the program citing that they, quote, needed to remain impartial on LGBTQ lives. Now- That's, that's good. Um, yeah, basically, uh, obviously Stonewall is getting, you know, they're taking a side in this uh, really serious political debate. And I think that the BBC is obligated to remain neutral. So there's no, basically, I also think it's true, for example, if Stonewall said that the conservative government are a bunch of terrible people, that would also probably have issues for the BBC because they have to remain neutral and impartial. Such as in the article, Who are the rich white men institutionalizing transgender ideology? by Jennifer Bilek in The Federalist. By framing transgender activism and advocacy as transgender ideology, Bilek is also playing into the Christian right messaging trope of gender ideology. On Fourth Wave Now, an anti-trans blog, Michael Biggs explores Open Society's Foundation's funding of, as he calls it, the gender industry complex. Which, by the way, as an aside... Sorry, can I just say really quickly, just, I hate to interrupt the aside with my aside, but, um... You say, like, George Soros is identified as a white man, so it seems like the focus isn't on him being a Jew. It's, you know, 
on him being a white man, which probably speaks to the privilege he has. Um, just really quick, wanted to make that point. I'd hear the gender industry. Are we like like making gender in factories now? But anyway, people are making money off of um, the uh, surgeries that are being done. Um, it's it is an industry. People make money off of it. Um, there's, I think, a very decent amount of money to be made from this whole uh, affirming people's gender identities stuff. Anyways, conspiracy theories about George Soros' participation in progressive advocacy are anti-Semitic, and they also contribute to violence against Jewish people. Every it's just, it's so dumb, because it's like, so you can't be critical of anything that a Jewish person has done? Evidence of anti-Semitism by anti-trans feminists is present throughout its academic history. In 1979, Janice Raymond referred to transgender men as the final solution of women in her book The Transsexual Empire, often cited as the basis for anti-transgender feminism. But, but that's literally her making reference to the Holocaust as a bad thing. That's not anti-Semitic. You, you say, like, she's basically making reference to this horrible thing that happened and saying, this is why it's a bad thing. This would only make sense if... Um, transgender men were a good thing right and then then janice raymond would be implying that the final solution is a good thing but janice raymond clearly doesn't think that transgender men or in other words trans identified females is a good thing uh and therefore obviously the extension is the final solution was a bad thing if in fact, I would actually think that uh, Janice Raymond would probably say that um, females coming to identify as trans is a really bad, terrible, awful, horrible thing. So, actually, the fact that she's also comparing it to the Holocaust would show that she thinks that's a really bad, terrible thing. Oh, a big, big anti-Semitism. You're against the Holocaust, you anti-Semite. And in 2018, Jen Isaacson erased the history of genocide of transgender people and the destruction of decades of research into transgender health during the Holocaust to discredit people using the term TERF. Wait, wh what was that sentence? Destruction of decades of research into transgender health during the Holocaust to discredit people using the term TERF. That is, that is a very strange sentence. I'm not sure what that's really referring to. Um, but I will say that if you're interested in this whole transgender research being uh, destroyed during the Holocaust. Uh, Rubble of Empires has a really interesting video on this. And I think at least one thing of note is that a lot of the um, the transgender researchers went on to work in concentration camps doing experiments and stuff. But yeah, I mean, apart from that, like this is, this is such a vague thing, like erase the history of uh, genocide of transgender people and the destruction of decades of research. It's like, um, well, what do you mean erased it? Do you mean disputed? some of the uh, implications of that being used like what what are you specifically saying it's it's a very general term what i'm suspecting is that it was either somebody uh, kind of disputing the narrative has for example rubble of empires has i might have just said vorsch i hope i didn't uh vorsch has a really interesting video on this so what I'm expecting is that this is either somebody disputing a narrative like Rubble of Empires did, or else arguing that this narrative is being misused and misappropriated by um, gender identity extremists when they talk about uh, gender critical individuals, uh, neither of which I think would speak to them being uh, anti-Semitic. On transgenderism being conspiracies made by Jewish folks is something that mirrors many alt-right and fascist viewpoints. For example, there's this quote... Uh, okay, I mean, first of all, it, if you're going to argue that... Um, uh, anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are uh, associated with the alt-right and, and fascists, you really don't need to waste any time arguing that point. I think I don't think anybody's going to disagree with you there. Um, yeah, I, I can... I mean, I don't even need to look at your arguments. I can accept the fact that, yes, the alt-right probably has uh, at least a few anti-Semitic conspiracy theories associated with it. So we're starting to see a connection between anti-Semitism and anti-LGBTQ views on the part of gender critical people and a connection to the alt-right. But these- Oh boy, what a reach. Goodness me. So basically, basically what you've done is you've taken the fact, first of all, your last two examples were nonsense. The Janice Raymond thing wasn't even remotely anti-Semitic and the other one was too vague to really say either way, um, but I'm just going to come out and say it definitely guaranteed was not actually anti-Semitic. So apart from that, you just have the fact that one Jewish billionaire is being spoken about as, as having done something bad. So your argument is, oh, if you say that a Jewish person has done something bad, even by the way, while referring to them as whites, which, oh yeah, I'm sure anti, uh, you know, actual anti-Semites would love to hear Jews be referred to as white. Um, even while doing that, 
you uh, apparently that's that's anti-semitic um so that's that's your evidence and now he's saying oh and this is this of course evidence is the fact that they are connected to the alt-right yeah, yeah it's it's nonsense it's absolutely ridiculous these links go even further the lgb <laughs> alliance even further founder bev jackson accepts funding from the heritage foundation a right-wing group in the united states that fights against abortion rights for women and other women's rights so okay yeah so basically uh, uh accepts funding from the heritage foundation um because i guess you're not supposed to if you actually care about fighting for rights you're supposed to want to uh you know make things harder for yourself by not accepting money um i don't know so we can see oh and by the way like the heritage can i just point this out the heritage foundation is not alt-right you know the heritage foundation they're not fascists ultimately accepting funding from a conservative organization is I possibly, I mean, it's hard to say which of the two arguments is a weaker argument for a connection to the alt-right, whether it's not being anti-Semitic, but I guess maybe if you kind of bent the truth completely 100%, um, you could pretend they're anti-Semitic, or whether it's accepting some funding from a conservative organization, uh, which I don't think anybody would describe as alt-right. For example, a group of gender critical feminists shouted at Black Lives Matter protesters while holding an I Heart JK Rowling banner. Okay, so this is a classic example of more information is necessary. And sure, I could go look for more information, but I would suspect that if more information would actually further prove your point, you would have included it. I suspect that actually, because more information wouldn't prove your point, the reality is that if you looked at more information, you would find out that actually this one way or another does not speak towards uh, these gender critical individuals actually in any meaningful sense being racist. Uh, I would perhaps expect, considering how much you hear phrases like um, black trans lives matter, and I think how much, yeah, the um, gender identity extremists really did hitch their wagon to black lives matter, chances are the uh, black lives matter people initiated the confrontation. Ultimately, I think a good rule of thumb I'm going to uh, stick with here, especially to kind of save time apart from anything else, is, like I say, if more details would prove your point, you should include more details. If there are a lot of details lacking and you're just left saying, basically, there was a confrontation between two different groups of people, um, I'm going to assume that that's literally the best you can do to make your case and that um, you don't want to include more details because that would destroy your case. Um, or indeed that no more details exist, in which case we don't know either way. Uh, but either way, not a very good argument. Parker Posey, a noted online gender critical feminist, Okay, I mean, it's fine. Okay, um, that's the wrong name. Also, as we already know from a previous video I did, Posey Parker was kicked out of a gender critical organization. Um, so basically, he, you know, and I, I saw somebody later on say basically like Posey Parker is very controversial in the gender critical community. So if like, it kind of says a lot that when these people want to prove their case that gender critical feminists are right wing, they always go to Posey Parker. Ultimately, if there's like one person who is your best piece of evidence, that tells you that that one person is the exception. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'll see specifically what Posey Parker said. Also spoke at this event and has also appeared in numerous videos alongside white nationalists. Speaking of- Hold, hold on a minute. Posey Parker appeared at this event. Let me just point this out, okay. Let's just, let's just get this. So. Black Lives Matter protesters while holding an I Heart JK Rowling banner. Parker Posey, a noted online gender critical feminist, also spoke at this event and has also- Okay, notice, also spoke at this event and there are these things set up. I love JK Rowling and it's got a thing. So this would presumably imply like the fact these things have been set up and that Posey Parker was a speaker there. This was a gender critical event and Black Lives Matter protesters showed up there. So what did I say? I said Black Lives Matter protesters probably initiated the confrontation and that would appear to be evidenced by the fact that they're the ones who showed up to this. It's like, goodness me, you don't have to be a racist to get annoyed when a bunch of Black Lives Matter protesters show up to interrupt your event. That doesn't, it doesn't make you a racist. Yeah, if, if you are a feminist organizing something and a bunch of Black Lives Matter protesters show up, yeah, I mean, tell you what, if a bunch of free Palestine protesters showed up, I'm sure they'd be annoyed at that too. It doesn't make them Zionists, you know? It's just, it's just so obvious, but whatever.
Speaking of the LGB alliance, though, one of the attendees at their recent conference was Annie Ngo, a noted alt-right conservative. I already addressed this in a video about Katie Montgomery, um, but basically uh, I think that saying, like, it's important to bear in mind, Andy Ngo is a, uh, I don't know if you pronounce it Andy Ngo, I'm sure by a proper, like, actual Southeast Asian pronunciation it would be Ngo, but uh, anyway... Um, he is same-sex attracted. So ultimately, while you can say you don't like his politics, and to be fair, I will say this, you know, I said this um, before, um, I don't really know what his politics are. I'm sure that he is associated with people on the right. I don't think that's a good enough reason to say that he is too right-wing to ever be, you know, represented by a pro LGB organization. The reality is if you're an organization to represent same-sex attracted individuals, uh, sure, you could say there's some same-sex attracted individuals who are so, like, have kind of such, let's say, internalized homophobia or lesbophobia or biphobia that you shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't be included in your movement. But uh, if you're just talking about somebody who has associations with the right, well, yeah, in that case, I don't think you've got a good enough reason to start excluding them from your movement that's supposed to be for representing lesbians, gays, and bisexuals. Why wouldn't you allow, I assume Andy No is a uh, gay man, why wouldn't you allow him there unless you have a very good reason not to? I think, you know, in this case, you need to give people the benefit of the doubt. Keep in mind, all right groups like the Proud Boys, besides their obvious fascism and authoritarian and violent tendencies, often also call for the return to traditionalist gender roles, denying women the right to do much beyond being demure housewives who don't vote and don't speak up. Okay, I just want to point out how tangential this is. It's like Andy Ngo went to, who is same-sex attracted, went to the LGB conference, and also he might have some established links to the Proud Boys, and the Proud Boys also are the types who have conservative views about gender roles. You can see how it's kind of like, sort of tangential in a way, isn't it? We can see that they actually do harm LGB rights issues, they do harm women's rights issues, and they do have links with racism and anti-Semitism, and are propped up and promoted and also often seen with white nationalists, alt-writers, and worse. They worse? <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know exactly what gets worse than that. Uh, but all right, maybe the worst is JK Rowling or something. Uh, basically, don't, don't, they, they go back against LGB issues. Well, I assume that's just referring to, uh, the fact that they were against Stonewall, which obviously ignoring the fact that they can easily support all the good things Stonewall was doing, LGB Alliance can do too. And other organizations can do too. Um, and that's certainly, um, a, good price to pay for uh, removing the extremely deleterious effects of uh, denying sex when it comes to fighting for same-sex attracted individuals rights. Um, apart from that, like hurting women's rights, I mean I don't even know what that's supposed to be with reference to. Um, I guess that's the tangential like, oh the Proud Boys are anti-woman and and the guy who knows the Proud Boys went to the LGBT Alliance conference and then obviously that's also the entire substance of the and they're linked to the right wing that this guy, Andy No, went there. Um, again, it's it's pretty, it's it's not very good, is it? Um, what do you expect, you know, coming here? Like, are you saying, like, you're not welcome, and literally, and, and they... Can I just point out that this person literally describes themselves as having gone undercover? So it, they literally were there to antagonize. Such as with this article that was published on the BBC last week. Now, this article was wonderfully broken down by my fellow YouTuber and friend Verily Bitchy, and you should watch her video up here, but let me quote and- uh, Somebody asked me to respond to that video, and I decided that I couldn't be bothered, um, which is, is good. Um, sorry. <laughs> Honestly, the main reason is just because I was excited to get this series started. Um, yeah, ultimately, I mean, sure, maybe I could have responded. Um, I'm sure there's got to be some other gender critical person who's responded. If someone lets me know another gender critical person who has responded to this, because it would be nice if that if there has been. I will I will link to to that person, or if you just mention who it is, I'll pin you because you know I do think it's something worth actually responding to. Um, but it's just not something you know which I could you know. I mean, sometimes I just can't respond to everything. I'm sorry, guys. An open letter signed by over twelve thousand folks who opposed the publishing of this article. The article headline may use the word some, but the clear implication of the article and its headline is that transgender women is a Am I right in saying that they found out that some of the signatures were false? I'm pretty sure I, I heard that. Um, it was something, again, like a lot of this was kind of stuff which I was just, you know, I look on Twitter and there's so much going on all the time. Um, but I remember seeing a thing about how, like, they had researched and, and looked into it and realized that a lot of the um, signatures weren't authentic. So there you go. 
The group that was surveyed already believe transgender women are men and should be prohibited from legal recognition as women, access to female gendered spaces out of fear that access will cause cis women to be sex. It's completely legitimate. Can I just point out, it's, it's legitimate to write an article about um, any any opinion. Like People seem to be acting as if this BBC article was supposed to be an academic journal, you know, or academic journal article, and it wasn't. So there we go. It's completely legitimate to do interviews with anybody who has a concern. Like somebody could, the BBC, if they wanted to, you know, if they please, you know, feel free, could do an interview with me. And th then you'd be like, oh, it's just a random, you know, they, they took a self-selected uh, sample of just this one guy who has a YouTube channel. It's like, well, yeah, that's because it's about like my experiences and, and my views and stuff like that. Um, that's, yeah, journalism, do, do they not know how it works? Like I say, it's not supposed to be an academic journal article. Lily Cade is a lesbian cisgender, i.e. non-transgender pornographer, with multiple allegations of sexual assault against women. It's really horrific that an article that's fear-mongering about the supposed horrors of- Obviously, somebody who does pornography is not, uh, by any definition, a radical feminist. I can personally say, I don't know who Lily Cade is. Um, she's obviously, you know, I mean, it goes without saying, not considered a gender critical feminist authority. Um, but you know, I mean, it's not really surprising the BBC would just interview whoever. The hypocrisy is staggering, especially for a supposed reputable news organization. But I'm, I mean, no, well, I, I will say this, okay. Um, the, yeah, the BBC was wrong to, I think, you know, platform this Lily Cade person, if indeed these accusations are accurate about um, them having or her having assaulted women. Of course, that's bad. And uh, I don't think it should have done it. In fact, I think they should have really just put the focus on speaking to gender critical feminists rather than uh, pornographers. Lily Cade published this on her website. And before I read it, I'm going to warn you, it's pretty gross and pretty scary. So if you don't want to see it... No, okay, can I just point out, it's not that... Like, the thing is, Lily Cade, who even knows about Lily Cade, right? Like, I'm not saying Lily Cade, I don't know, isn't some kind of... Obviously, must be some degree of famous, but I don't know Lily Cade. I don't think anyone else knows Lily Cade. You know, it's not J.K. Rowling or something who's um, who's tweeted this. It's not Posey Parker, even. It's somebody who's very peripheral, um, and even more so, I think, to this debate. I mean, may maybe Lily Cade is famous as a pornographer. Is Lily Cade famous as a gender-critical feminist advocate? No, and I don't think uh, the majority of gender-critical feminists would even want to allow a pornographer to be famous as, as an advocate. So maybe in the specifics of what I said, there'll be something to unpack, but ultimately what I expect is that Lily Cade, I mean... By the sound of things, a pornographer with uh, sexual assault allegations against women, uh, it seems like, yeah, I could easily believe this person would have some pretty uh, dodgy views that I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't endorse. It's kind of it's kind of not really surprising, is it? And certainly not really a basis to criticize the gender critical movement and gender critical individuals more broadly. Look with abject shame upon the affront to God and nature they have wrought in the service of the. Okay, can I just point this out? Like, um, affront to God. Like, it's pretty clear this person has some weird stuff going on. Like, this is not what I. Like, no gender critical person would say that. <laughs> no gender critical feminist would be like, they're an affront to God. Um. Being honest with all of you, I am currently reading these lines now, uh, after I have recorded and am editing the video, and. Uh, this sucks to read. I'm about to finish editing this video, and... I, 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 so, sorry, okay, like, I get it, but the reality is, of course it sucks, but it's clearly so... Dare I say, un I mean, the thing is, like, I do recognize that this anger comes from Lily Cade. The anger comes from a real place, um, and I can recognize that. And I can recognize that there are probably gender-critical feminists who can understand where Lily Cade's anger is coming from. But the expression of that with this type of language is clearly so mental that I don't really see how anyone could be negatively affected by it. Like, do, do you not realize there are so many, it's just so obvious, there are so many, uh, like, trans-identified males in particular who 
talk about murdering and like doing horrible, horrible things to uh, gender critical women. And it's like, boy, we, we I, well, I was going to say we, obviously I'm not a woman, just in case that wasn't clear. Um, but uh, gender critical individuals more generally, and of course, gender critical women to whom these, uh, you know, attacks are almost universally uh, directed really don't ham it up that much. I don't think they go like, oh, you know, it was horrible because like, that's the thing, even though, and that's the thing with, when you talk about uh, threats of violence against gender critical individuals, it's a much more systemic problem. Ultimately, the point is that even while uh, these violent threats against gender critical women are so much more frequent and so horrendously violent and uh, malicious, they uh, gender critical women don't really let it get to them that much. Uh, and then you compare that to you've got this one woman who is just so obviously not really reflective of actual kind of gender critical mainstream views on innumerable accounts, whether it's talking about uh, trans identified people being an affront to God, or of course, literally being a pornographer, um, that, you know, th this is not representative of mainstream views in the gender critical movement. And it's one example. Uh, and yeah, sure, it is violent language, and it's pretty unpleasant. But I'm just surprised that somebody would read this and surely they must, you know, uh, Jesse Gender must deep down be aware of how non-representative this is of actual gender critical views and yet is apparently still really upset by it. Lily Cade is calling for the literal genocide and lynching of transgender people. And she also highlights many of the things that I've been talking about throughout this video. The same rhetoric used by gender critical feminists. The, the point about same rhetoric is is true. Um, again, like this shouldn't be a new phenomenon. Legitimate concerns can sometimes motivate people to be, you know, very kind of violent in terms of what they're doing. You know, like there will be people who have legitimate issues and then there'll be other people who take that way too far. It would be like, you know, um, obviously there are people who legitimately, I'm just going to go to the obvious example that comes to me in the UK and a very famous example of terrorism. There were people who thought that uh, Northern Ireland should be part of Ireland. And, you know, I think there are a lot of people who had that opinion who just had it for reasons that they thought were very reasonable. And, um, you know, they had actually thought about it quite a lot and, you know, were basically uh, intelligent in, in their reasoning process. And then there were other people who took that and were like, yes, let's go commit acts of terrorism. Let's go blow stuff up and things like that. Um, because they thought that's the way we're going to achieve a, uh, you know, kicking the British out of Northern Ireland. Ultimately, I would say that actually the, in a sense, danger of being correct on, on any point is that people might read what you're saying and agree with you. And you're going to have with that people who agree so enthusiastically that they express that as violence. Um, so the reality is it's not really surprising to me that there are people who take gender critical ideas and then add on to that um, their own kind of violent tendencies. Because it's like, sure, if, you, if you're if you a violent person, yeah, I can imagine you would get angry about stuff. And then on top of that, there's the fact that what gender critical feminists are concerned about are pretty justified reasons to be angry. I mean, it's just, you know, it's kind of like the reason why eco-terrorism is a thing. Not because environmentalists are horrible people and evil and violent, but because it's quite, you know, people get angry about how much um, failure there is to actually uh, address environmental issues. It makes them angry and it makes people who express that anger with violence likely to at least talk about, and they might actually do, um, the, you know, these kind of attacks and stuff like that. That's the point. You can't blame, you can't blame gender critical feminists for being so correct in their concerns that it's literally the kind of stuff that makes you angry. If your argument is that, you know, people aren't allowed to complain about stuff that might make people angry, uh, then, yeah, I suppose um, you, you might have a case. But I would say, you know what, you know, if you complain about things that make people angry, you are going to get people who express the anger with um, words that are kind of violent and certainly words I wouldn't endorse. These are the types of people that get platformed saying how worried they are about transgender people being harmful to women's rights. Those type of people. No, notice now, that those oh sorry clear. i i thought i'd press pause um those types of people one example in one article 
from okay can i just point out how unrelated being gender critical is to this you've got the bbc not a gender critical organization um you know at best i mean the, the thing we're kind of excited about the bbc is they're starting to get a bit more kind of on the side of being gender critical the bbc still have a lot of problems you know the bbc i don't think most gender critical feminists would describe themselves as broadly enthusiastic about bbc so bbc not a gender critical organization uh and then you have lily cade a pornographer uh again not really associated with the gender critical movement so you basically have a non-gender critical publication platforming a non-gender critical individual and it becomes these are the types of people as if this is reflective of the gender critical movement. I as a trans person am being told I'm a pedophile, being told I'm an angry gross man trying to dehumanize and sexualize me by people who are either being instigated by or who are folks who wish me dead for just being trans and just trying to be involved in fights Sorry, can I say, being instigated by, it seems like, if anything, you know, Lily Cade seems to have been instigated by uh, generally kind of gender critical viewpoints. It doesn't seem like there are people at the top kind of, um, you know, like I say, instigating people, uh, really kind of spreading these ideas who have really particularly violent tendencies at all. Meanwhile, as all of this is going on, trans people just trying to live. Can I just point out one other thing? In the thumbnails of this video, it has JK Rowling, Graham Linehan, Lily Cade, and then I think some uh, some guy, I think maybe from the uh, 2017 March on wherever, Charlottesville. Um, here's the thing. So far, J.K. Rowling and Graham Lennon haven't been mentioned. So essentially, what we have here is a vague conversation about being gender critical. And then the first actual person mentioned is Lily Cade, who, yeah, sure, I can agree, has some pretty intense views, um, but is not really gender critical. I mean, I guess technically would fall under the category of being gender critical, um, possibly. I mean, it seems like there are some, you know, touching on some gender critical points of view, but not like a major person in the gender critical movement, seemingly just somebody who has recognized that some gender critical points of view are valid and is angry <laughs> to in extremis, let's say, to put it mildly. Um, but yeah, it's certainly not anybody who's really considered an authority or respected by gender critical individuals. With text saying 50% of transgenders take their own lives, this fills me with so much sadness. But the music playing in the background was Bon Hovi's Living on a Prayer, the part where Mr. Hovi says we're halfway there. The implication being, you know what the implication is, right? I don't have to explain that. Yeah, what Noah points out there, what Noah finds there is... Okay, I guess I'm pausing here just to say, did that guy look like he was a um, gender critical feminist? No. Not outright calling for my death or my suicide, but people wink wink nudge nudging it just enough to be missed by censors or by people who don't necessarily know these, you know, dog whistles. But Yeah, okay, this is the legitimate thing, by the way, um, these references to these percentages. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's it's the internet. Like, I don't want to, when you say it, it sounds dismissive. I don't mean it to sound dismissive, but it's like, you can't criticize a movement, a political movement, by talking about mean things people said to you on the internet. Because mean people saying things on the internet is a constant. This, by the way, is the issue that the BBC wishes to, quote, remain neutral on, a phrase which actually here means platforming these gender critical groups while removing protections in their workplace for trans people. Oh, and also... Um, so let's just clarify, the BBC are being neutral because uh, engaging with different points of view and giving different points of view a platform to express things while not actually offering support for those points of view, just giving them a platform to be expressed uh, is neutral and certainly BBC uh, gives um, trans identified individuals and gender identity extremists plenty of space to express their points of view. Uh, you know, you would have to, in order to make this case, you'd have to show that the BBC really underrepresents uh, trans identify points of view and the fact that they've rejected Stonewall like I said I mean that was their call to make with that they thought that Stonewall was not uh, in keeping with their desire to be neutral it's not really relevant like an article they publish versus um, certain protections they have in their work those two things don't really interface when it comes to the BBC's you know principles of neutrality but I mean the thing is like obviously the BBC's like principles of neutrality are not going to be perfect and sometimes they can be really rubbish in a way that makes me very angry um, but Ultimately, you know, like, I, I would say, you know, expecting the BBC to always satisfy everyone 
is not really uh, fair. And to be fair, I think that's the idea of the BBC. It's like, oh, they get um, complaints from 50% of people, they get complaints from 50% of people from the other side, and then they know they've done their job, which I think is kind of silly because it's like, well, actually, maybe one side gets more easily offended than the other. So it's like you might get 50% of complaints just because you put like one foot wrong from their perspective and then only 50% of complaints when you do lots for the other side you know basically bbc neutrality it is a lofty goal and one which they don't always uh, successfully achieve but i think you need a lot of evidence if you're going to try to argue that you can seriously accuse them of being what like self-evidently transphobic or something uh, just based on one article. Someone warned the article's writers and the BBC about Lily before they published this article, and they still went ahead with publishing it anyways, showing how clearly the BBC isn't remaining neutral, but is letting the anti-trans bias of these turfs become normalized as the quote neutral position when it is anything but. Sorry, just noticed that. Lily Cade, turf. Lily Cade, radical feminist. Pornographer, radical feminist. And it is gross and stands against everything that journalism should stand for. But it should present the facts, the true facts, and present a true account of how those facts show- I just can't get over the fact that this is literally- so much of this is about Lily Cade. Like, I felt like I kind of swallowed that Lily, but I was like, Lily. I kind of hope the other videos will be better than this. Because, yeah, this video, I mean, maybe it will improve, but so far it's really not- saying anything about the gender critical movement it's just talking about this lily cade person who basically can we just point out like it seems to me like lily cade has almost kind of become famous based on this uh you know rant um you know this kind of violent language rant so it's like it's not as if lily cade was an established gender critical individual who then oh you know said this insane thing. No, Lily Cade, as far as I can tell, is only really known now for having made these statements. I never heard Lily Cade mentioned before then. So yeah, it's not really, like, that's the thing. It's just, why are you talking about Lily Cade so much? Donald Trump and his reluctance to disavow David Duke, former head wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. At the time that happened, that was major news because everyone disavows the Ku Klux Klan. Even politicians whose policies would seem to very much line up with the things that people like members of the Klan would want, they disavow them. But Trump didn't. And when somebody calls for the death of people, an entire group of people, you disavow that. And at this point, to not do so, as far as I'm concerned, is a co-signing of her statements. The, but the BBC is like a massive organization, right? This isn't the same thing as Donald Trump, one individual, uh, not, uh, you know, disavowing David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan, a specific organization. Uh, this is, if anything, this is the opposite way around, which makes it different. Um, you know, like an individual can disavow an organization, but an organization disavowing an individual is a bit more complicated because... Um, th therefore, you know, if you disavow something, that's quite a definitive thing to do. There's also the fact, of course, that the BBC tries to be apolitical and neutral while Donald Trump was literally running to be the president. I think it matters a bit more uh, that somebody who is running to be the president disavows certain viewpoints than that a neutral organization does so. Ultimately, I'm perfectly happy for the BBC not to go out of their way to disavow certain individuals um, because that's how much I think, you know, the um, neutrality of the BBC is important. And of course, in this case, yeah, sure, you could say, well, it's a pretty obvious thing to disavow these very specific statements, but does the BBC need to disavow them? And just think about what this is saying. It's saying it's a tantamount to support. So are you seriously suggesting that at this point onwards, the BBC can be considered... <laughs> The BBC could be considered to be an organization that supports the deaths of trans identified people. Like, that's what you're, that's the thing. If you're actually saying this, you need to, like, actually own that. That's what you're saying. You're saying, yes, the BBC from this moment onward should be considered to be an organization that supports the things Lily Cade said because they didn't uh, disavow her. Okay, fine. You know, if that's what you think, I'll let that stand on its own. There we go. So, that's the statement. If you feel that I need to refute that, I mean, okay, I'm not going to. I'm just going to assume that maybe uh, just hearing that statement that from now on, the BBC should be considered to literally support the deaths of trans-identified people. Uh, that's apparently what we're expected to believe, and that's what this person believes. 
Unless you think I'm just trying to use one person like Lily Cade to paint. Okay. Wow. Finally. Finally, you're gonna move. But notice this. Okay. Can I just? It's like I'm half excited, but oh my. So like we're finally away from Lily Cade because I was literally getting, I was preparing myself mentally to get to the end of this video, get to the conclusion. This video might even end up just being one video. I'm not sure. Um, I mean, it's possible there's like 20 minutes left, so it's very likely that there might be more to it. I might try and record it in one video. Anyway, sorry, what am I saying? Basically, um, I was getting prepared to be like, oh, hey guys, this video was literally just about Lily Cade. Um... And I was you know, going to be like, it was basically kind of lying where it says exploring the gender critical radicalization pipeline. Because in fact, Lily Cade is, you know, I mean, not a famous gender critical person. And this doesn't really reflect anything like a pipeline. Just got one individual. It, yeah, it would just be absurd. But now we've got Posey Parker, except Posey Parker is also like very fringe. And again, I, okay, let's see what Posey Parker said. Take, for example, the aforementioned gender-critical Posey Parker calling for men with guns to start using women's toilets in order to protect them. Them meaning cisgender gender-critical feminists like Posey Parker. Not only does this reveal how... Oh, so that's not suggesting violence, though. That's suggesting, um... I mean, it's, it's a ridiculous thing to suggest, I should say. <laughs> like, that is absurd. I mean, that's... Posey Parker's British, right? Since when should we be having guns? I don't know, but, um... Basically, it's important to understand that that's not a call for violence unless you're suggesting that um, trans-identified people would start attacking women, in which case, well. In reality, these feminists are just attacking and targeting transgender people in order to prop themselves up. Everyone else be damned. And I'll repeat again. What do you mean? But you just said that they're hurting women, and now you're saying that they're just trying to prop themselves up. What do you mean by themselves? Like, I can understand if you meant they're just trying to prop themselves up, meaning biological females, but... You seem to be implying that they're hurting biological females too. I'm not sure. Anyway, I will point out that we literally got one story about Posey Parker and that's it. So you're like, oh, just in case you know, if you just thought I was talking about Lily Cade, um, no, we've got Posey Parker too for one little, tiny little section. At the expense of not only trans rights, but the rights of all women, black rights, the rights of people in color in general, the rights of gay, lesbian, and bisexual people. <sighs> I just, I can't, I can't refute just like a constant barrage of claims that have really not been evidenced at all. So just let it be known that this isn't, that there's not an argument being said. It's just, oh, they're, they're also ruining it for, uh, they're, they're ruining it for black rights, for children's rights, for old people's rights. Okay. People and more. And they are being propped up and supported by white supremacist and right wing organizations. Because those groups like this is literally considering that this video is like the first video I've chosen to I hope they're better they get better than this because literally this is just like you're just stating things you're not even arguing stuff you're saying and they're supported by white supremacists as the amazing Judith Butler wrote in an article that you must read and I will link below and if you get anything after this video like go and read anything after this video it is this article she states not a good sign this but they are typical of fascist movements that twist rationality to suit hypernationalist aims. Yeah, gender critical feminists, hypernationalists. Gender critical feminists mainly only focus on attacking white trans women, often forcing trans men and transgender people of color to be invisible in the public eye. An invisibility. That seems like a weird thing to say. Because we're not attacking, um, you know, uh, trans identified individuals who are not white, um, it, it's, it's even worse because we're making them invisible. I would say, can I just point out the obvious thing here? Like, this is the really bizarre thing about this is actually the reason why there's mostly a focus on uh, white trans-identified individuals is because white people are much more prominent in the movement. So it's not it's not our fault. Um, you know, if if genuinely, like, if a if I actually saw a um, video by a black trans-identified individual that I thought was worth responding to. I would do that, but I, I don't see that very much. I'm aware of some, and sometimes I've clicked on their videos to see if there's anything I can respond to. They haven't done anything I can respond to, so that's just, um, you know, it'll often be, for example, Cat Black, I think, has never really made many videos that even tried to argue in defense of um, gender identity. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've really just not had a cause to respond to any non-white trans-identified individuals because they just don't seem to be very prominent in your movement. You don't seem to be elevating them in your movement. Um, so yeah, basically that's why it's not, I mean, it's like the, the logic 
itself was absurd. Like, you're not attacking them, which is even worse because it means they're invisible. Um, I mean, that seems like the kind of thing a narcissist would say. But basically, uh, you know, apart from that, there's the fact, well, do you want to know why we're really not attacking them? It's because you aren't elevating these people in your movement. And don't get me wrong. I mean, well, here's the issue. I was going to say, well, gender critical people could elevate black people more. But the most subscribed, I'm pretty sure, like the most subscribed kind of um, regularly uploading, like I know there's Ariel Scarcella who does upload, but um, I don't know, doesn't seem to be that regular. But the most subscribed proper full-on gender critical YouTuber is, uh, you're kidding, right? Who's black? The reality is that if there was a, you know, gender identity extremist channel that did what I did, I don't think it could possibly exist. But if it did, um, obviously I like to try and spend a decent amount of time responding to some of the biggest, uh, gender identity extremist channels. And I've never had to respond to a, uh, a channel run by a non-white person. If, uh, if there was an equivalent, they would presumably have to spend a lot of time responding to channels like, you're kidding, right? So they would have to respond to black gender critical voices because there are such prominent black gender critical voices. And it causes us to not focus on how trans women of color are often the most attacked, marginalized, and often at the most- No, you can focus on it. No one's stopping you from focusing on it. Um, you know, ultimately, it's kind of, it's, it's your choice and you're choosing not to most risk of being murdered and on top of that it forces us to constantly only bring up trans women of color can I, can I just point this out actually like literally when it was like trans day of remembrance i saw someone point out it's basically just um uh prostitutes of the global south murder day or whatever basically the point they were making is that actually when you look at actual um deaths of trans identified people it's overwhelmingly you know you look to the global south the americas um south asia and, or sorry, I say the Americas, Latin America, South Asia, Africa, and I guess, um, and the Middle East too, where there are numbers, you know, significant numbers of, uh, trans identified sex workers, and they do get murdered. The reality is that actually, people who talk about trans remembrance day and act as if this is a broad phenomenon for like, um, you know, that's really particularly relevant in the West, in the UK, where I think actually they've found that proportionally fewer, uh, trans people are killed than you would even like that, than would actually, well, what I just said, proportionally, it's fewer than the uh, actual non-trans population. So, you have the UK where that's the case, but people act as if Trans Day of Remembrance applies here. As if there's like some cause for a Trans Day of Remembrance here. As if there is a murderous violence against trans identified people in the UK when there isn't. And by doing that, by acting as if it's a thing that's relevant to this country, uh, they're actually erasing the reality that it is a problem in the global south for women of color, for, uh, you know, Hispanic women, for black women, for South Asian women. They're, they're ignoring that. So actually, I would say that it's the gender critical individuals who are putting the focus in the right place. We're saying there is a problem for murder rates of prostitutes in the global south who are uh, individuals who aren't white, of course. That's a serious problem. There really isn't a problem and there isn't, really isn't much of an intersection with the supposed problems of trans-identified individuals, you know, predominantly white male trans-identified individuals, but also white female trans-identified individuals in the West. And that, you know, gender critical people seem to be palpably aware of that, while lots of gender identity extremists seem to either not be aware of that or willing to ignore that for political gain in the West so that they can act as if um, the, these uh, murders of uh, trans identified individuals uh, of color. Uh, I always feel weird about that phrase of color because I know it's like a kind of term that's used by the wokies a lot, but yeah. Um, that, that those individuals are, they're going to use that actual concern in order to, uh, advance their case for the idea that, uh, it means that we need to recognize their trans identities as valid or else it's literally, you know, uh, killing them. It shows how truly intricate and complex and interwoven all these different types of marginalizations are and are meant to divide us instead of bring us together. I don't know what that sentence just was. Let's, let's take that really slow. Ignoring that trans women of color even exist. It shows how truly intricate and complex exist.
It shows a truly intricate and complex and interwoven all these different types of marginalizations are and are meant to divide us instead of bring us together. When all these different shows a truly women of color even exist. Okay, ready for this. It shows a truly intricate. Until the. the, the <laughs> Until the, the truly and complex and interwoven, all these different types of marginalizations are. So we gotta until the something something how complex these different types of marginalizations are, are and are meant to divide us instead of bring us together. And are meant to divide us instead of bring us together. Okay, so I think literally what that was saying, <laughs> I think I got there, was um, that. Marginalization marginalizes people. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with that. Oh no, what a waste of time. <laughs> it causes people to essentialize trans people as only caring about trans issues. It's when we talk about many numerous other things. I mean, for my own example, look at the fact- What about ja, ba -ja, ja, ja, ba -ja, ba -ja. This exactly happens with being gender critical, right? Like, I feel like there are so many people- Well, so many people. I feel like people who- make any effort to know me but also would not really agree with me um might well i say make any effort to know me who watch my youtube content but don't agree with me might think man you're, you're obsessed i mean i do get this comment sometimes you're obsessed with trans identity you're obsessed with trans women and trans men and contrapoints or whatever else i think these people would be very shocked to realize how much of a or rather how little of an intersection there is between this stuff and just my regular life like it's just you know and i'm not saying i don't i mean i'm not saying i don't care about it uh, or anything like that I'm just saying that actually for me, this is something I, I put on a camera and I talk about this and, you know, it is something I care about. And, you know, I look on Twitter and stuff like that. And I find it interesting. But actually, you, there are so many people who know me who just would not even know that this is something I talk about because it's not something I talk about in a lot of instances. So, yeah, I agree that, like, um, y you can uh, certainly, like, assume that because somebody's talking about one thing, you kind of just think, oh, that's that's their thing when actually that might not be true. Uh, I just want to point out that that's like a thing which applies everywhere. Um, and I tell you what, this is, this video is so unfocused that I'm responding to. And I guess by extension, this video as well, because it's just like, it's really hard to just not be completely overwhelmed by how little, um, I also find it's funny that this is still technically under the section BBC scandal. Uh, but yeah, uh, really hard because it's like, I don't know, like, I put a lot of effort when I made those two videos on like why it is that like it was, you know, the gender critical progressive or conservative. I really put a lot of effort into thinking about it and making sure my points were kind of well argued and like one followed from the other and like it was kind of easy to digest. And it's just this is very kind of scatological. It's just coming from all locations. It's like suddenly now we're talking about this and it's like, well, does anyone, you know, I mean, it's just, it's not really relevant to the point. Like very little of this has really been relevant to the idea that there's supposedly a gender critical radical, and I'm assuming gender critical radicalization means gender critical to extreme right wing, um, pipeline. I mean, if you're just talking about gender critical people becoming more radical over time, well, that's maybe going to happen. But also in many other cases, these dynamics are being used in exactly the same way against exactly the same type of people as they were in Sojourner Truth's time. Like how Black Lives Matter movements are often framed divisively. And it illustrates how these different fights about how these framings of trans rights or black rights or all these different things while framed divisively are actually connected together and are all... I mean, it seems to me like what's basically being missed here is the fact that it is true that um, issues which apply to black women, but because they are black could arguably be said to not be feminist issues. They're black issues. Like if you say, well, this isn't happening because you're a woman, it's happening because you're black. That's where the issue or the objection comes from. Now, I want to stress, of course, that yes, obviously, um, that's something which could be contended. And I think that's kind of where the whole idea of intersectionality comes from. And in some instances, you know, intersectionality has a place. Um, I think you can make an argument. Can you really say like, well, um, you know, if you're a black woman, you need to keep the stuff that happens to you because you're black separate from the stuff that happens to you because you're a woman. No. But then having said that, I mean, it is true that there is a distinction. For example, a black woman being sexually assaulted is because she's a woman, uh, whereas a black woman 
uh, I don't know, being called a racist term is because she's black. But there are areas in the middle. For example, it could be that a black woman being assaulted by a white wo- uh, sorry, a black woman being assaulted by a white man would be an intersection of these two things. Uh, that's just one example of how, you know, there can be uh, intersections. But also, I think it is worth bearing in mind there is a distinction. I think kind of it seems like Jesse Jen is almost trying to say that if you just acknowledge a distinction at all, um, then you're, you know, I don't know, being bigoted or something. Well, pretty much just different sides and fronts of the same fights. And even those who are not the explicit... I'm sorry, that was like fronts. <laughs> I want to listen to that fronts again. Pretty much just different sides and fronts of the same fights. And even those... <laughs> friends. <laughs> I didn't know. Friends. <laughs> of the same friends. <laughs> uh, these are the kind of things... Oh my goodness, I've been recording for too long. Oh my mind hey guys so i wasn't sure whether this video was going to end up being one part or two parts and also it was kind of hard to know exactly when to stop recording so i just decided to record it in one big chunk which meant i couldn't have a specific moment where i said okay time to stop now uh but i am now saying okay time to stop now uh i have edited it and i have made it so it's into roughly two equal chunks and this chunk it was the first chunk, and then there'll be a second chunk. Standard, me creating two parts in editing procedure. This is probably going to be a completely random cutoff point, and part two is going to pick up at a completely random cutoff point too. So I'll just scratch my nose and say that, um, you know, obviously get excited for that and get hyper. And um, please do like, share, and subscribe. Comment below so let me know what you think. Um, and how excited you are for part two. Say, hey, I can't believe I have to wait until Sunday for part two. When I, I, I would, I would, I would rather, frankly, that it, it were, it were, it was Saturday that it was coming up, or perhaps even later this evening. Um, comment that. Oh, I shouldn't ask people to comment specific things because I don't think people even watch these outros. Um, I think they see that it is the outro, and then they just stop watching. Because why would you just? I mean, to be fair, even when I respond to videos, sometimes I, I don't actually watch. To the end. For all I know, there are these uh, post-credit scenes where they suddenly just immediately give their arguments for um, for gender identity extremism. They're like, you know, after they say, you know, the whole outro stuff, and they spend a long time doing it, and I stop reviewing because I'm like, okay, you know, there's no point in me just being sat here watching all this outro stuff. Maybe in the post-credit scene they say, and this is exactly why. This is the perfect logical reason why it makes sense to say that a biological male can be a woman. And I always miss it. And you'll miss it too because right now you're not watching this. You thought he's just going off on a rant. Who does he think he is, wasting my time and his, going off on a rant? Well, guess what? Um, uh, please do give on Patreon if you want to support what I'm doing, and I'll just say thank you to my current patrons. In addition to their names scrolling past on your screen right now, I would like to give a special thanks to last month's patrons Kaiser, Mojave, Bianca, Anon, Devon, and... Jillian, you're all very appreciated.